All right, here we go. Episode 81. Thank you guys for being a part of this one. And big thanks to our guest, Traver Bohm, for being a part of this as well. Really, the whole episode is him. So (laughs) thank you to him and to his book here, Man Uncivilized, which I'll have um, linked, of course. And, you know, just look at it for a second if you're on the YouTube and you can kind of see visually how striking it can be already and the message is really cool in there as well and that's really more important so this book sort of found me just out of the blue and I guess I was looking for answers because there they came to me (laughs) and obviously I'm a uh, parkour athlete who's you know been redirecting some of my energy and attention that I used to put into parkour now into this podcast and other areas of my life and trying to grow outside of where I was so singularly focused at one time. And I think that fork, that journey, that redirection of energy is coming for us all, you know, and of course it is, you know, you guys have probably already experienced it several times, maybe even unconsciously, but it's going to come again And it's nice when you hit these forks in the road, which can be very jarring, which can make you sort of feel lost to have somebody with some wisdom to help guide you back on the path, um, on your path, really. And that's what this book is really all about, I'd say. And it breaks down these two archetypes, you know, in the beginning, which are the ancient, outdated archetype and the new, just un- tested unreliable archetype you know that's kind of the two paradigms that we have always available to us it's kind of an always ever-present issue for for mankind but you know in his book it's the marble man the 1950s just hardened dude who just just that's about as much emotion as you get out of him right there and he can he can get shit done but he doesn't communicate with himself or with anyone else very well and he's pretty out of touch with his emotions and in in feminine side you could say and then there's the new age paradigm which is just this i don't know i don't actually i don't even know how to do an impression without just you know what it's actually more like me 10 year or 10 uh, days ago when i'm like crying and whatever because that'll be me when i'm like lost sometimes um i'll break down and I'll, I'll just be too sensitive it's a sensitive new age nice guy is what he calls it the snag and you know we all have times where we're, we're both of these people right but ideally we're trying to be balanced down the path and that is you know, the ethos that he's laid out in this book, he's got 12 principles. He's really got these four categories, even that he breaks the book down into more broadly, but, um, just something to help bounce your mind off of it and, you know, reorient yourself. And it's really good to have somebody like Trevor around because he's lived through these, these redirections of energy. He's lived through forks in the road and he's come out and adapted and strengthened himself through all of that and when somebody can put it on paper and really blunt and kind of direct in your face terms like he does something that's easy to read that can get through my thick skull um, and yours too hopefully it'll be beneficial to you and that's one of the reasons why i like him is he's really direct and the the whole uncivilized movement that he's starting is kind of just helping men figure that out and and you can understand why even even the existence of a men's empowerment kind of movement is can be controversial and so we, we talk about that a little bit in the episode as well but it's it's clear to me that you know sometimes people need to be reminded of why men need to show up for another man and how they can do that and what that sense of brotherhood is that we all love you know that i found in parkour but that can also disappear within parkour and you need to recreate it in certain other ways and it can just it, it's just things will happen in your life where you'll need to to change and adapt of course so please enjoy this podcast um and please le- reach out to to me or with Traver with any questions because i'm i'm very sure that he will respond he's really really i mean it's great that he did this podcast and he didn't hesitate so we really appreciate him being a part of this um 
what else can I say that you won't hear in the podcast? I don't know. I don't know and I don't care because it's time to listen to it. Here we go. Yeah, I was, I was looking you up beforehand. That's pretty awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we had a guy, like I used to own a gym in California and we had a guy come in and uh, he was like, hey, can I teach parkour here? And of course we were like, what the fuck's parkour? <laughs> <laughs> sure. He jumped from the pull-up bar to pull-up bar to pull-up bar to pull-up bar. And we were like, what? <laughs> first of all, you're going to kill somebody. Uh, second of all, like, please put a helmet on. Uh, and yes, you can teach here. <laughs> it's amazing. You remember who he was? His name was, uh, God, I'll have to get you his last name. James something. He was, he was a fascinating dude. He was a PhD in robotics. Whoa. Yeah, at UCSB. He was just like, this is really what I want to do with myself, despite <laughs> getting a PhD. His dad was a, uh, uh, a remote surgeon. So think about that. His dad would stay in an office <clears throat> and do surgery via robotics on someone that was like in Iowa. That's mind blowing. And that, yeah, when he explained <laughs> it to us, it was like everything about you is fascinating. <laughs> so that was your introduction into parkour. And then yeah. since then, have you seen it reappear in your life much or is it, is it still been peripheral? Uh, it's still been peripheral. I left the gym world and it didn't really, uh, I didn't follow with it. I just saw Tim Ferriss posted a video of some dude doing some monumental human gymnastics trick <laughs> that I imagine was parkour. And I was like, I, mean, I had to watch it like four times to see like what the body movement was. It was insane. But yeah, parkour is not really in my world right now. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it's a great way to get fit. You know, I can't recommend it enough, but obviously you are ready and in uh, in great shape doing all kinds of stuff like you study martial arts and you yeah you're a crossfit gym owner it sounded like and i was at the time yeah 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 not anymore that was uh that was a different lifetime yeah <laughs> i uh yeah i worked with the uh, parkour gyms out here for a long time as well and i've just yeah. shifted into and working in a different field as well with that but is it big here in colorado colorado's got a big community it's like amazing it's it's one of the first places where people started doing it just because people are fit, I guess, and yeah, because people are crazy out here. But yeah. um, but now it's 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 spread virtually everywhere. You know, the, anywhere you find it or anywhere you go, you're gonna find people that are doing it. This is definitely one of the hubs. We have like more gyms here probably than almost any other place in America for sure. No kidding. Do you think stuff like um, and I know and if we're getting off track, just oh yeah, no, direct. <clears throat> Do you think stuff like American Ninja Warrior helped parkour? That's a really good question. Because or Spartan racing, or even I know it's not the same, but it's like, oh, you can move differently than a deadlift or a bicep curl. Well, <laughs> it, for you know, I think it's open to interpretation. I think it helps ultimately just because I choose to have like a an outlook where it's like rising tide and if if it gets more people exposed to it good if it gets more right. people just even curious or even familiar with the term yeah it's doing something but as a practitioner you do get annoyed with people always asking you and i've yeah. been on the show actually i've been on ninja warrior oh you have um you know and it was an experience but it was television and it wasn't parkour and it wasn't something that really interested me um yeah. you know there's a lot of parkour athletes that kind of transitioned towards that but you kind of have to pick if you want to be great at one or the other you can't really um do both they're too different yeah i remember the uh olympic lifting community hated crossfit <laughs> and i was like hey you guys went up in membership by like ten thousand <laughs> percent after crossfit came on the scene yeah your coaches went from being like gym teachers to guys holding thousand uh, dollar entries workshops so yeah, CrossFit might have done some Olympic lifting at the wrong speed and intensity, but it introduced the masses to a clean and jerk and a snatch and uh you know and, and movements like that. Even parkour, like we wouldn't have known about parkour without CrossFit. Exactly. You know, yeah, there was a lot. Yeah, there was a lot of divisiveness early on in the community, and I'm sure it goes with any community of just like this is that and this isn't, and people trying to like stake out yeah. the the borders of the culture and. Ultimately, you know, people are wasting their time, I think, with most of that because it's just like the ads, it adds to the exposure, right? So, you know, people sure. used to shit on CrossFit too in the parkour community. And I'm like, why do yeah. we care what they're doing? You yeah. know, people are in shape and they, and if someone likes, and someone comes in and jumps from 
the pull-up bars to the other pull-up bars one day, then maybe more people will get into what we're doing. But it's not. <laughs> yeah, who cares if it's not for everybody? You know, it's it just doesn't matter. To each their own. If you're doing it, you know, I like it obviously. So I'm doing. Right on. Agreed. So you know, again, I really appreciate you coming on because. You know, this pleasure, is a man. small podcast, but, um, and, and you're going to be talking to some people I think that can really use, you know, I finished reading your book. I've been rereading certain chapters and Amazing. it's really powerful. It's really important for a lot of young men, a lot of people going through like kind of where I'm at in my mm-hmm. stage of life. And, and, um, you know, just because a lot of these young parkour athletes as, and just to, to use the analogy for parkour, cause there's going to be, you know, a lot of, of that here, mm-hmm. it, you know, we spent a lot of time getting really disciplined and really good at this physical activity. And then some of us, you know, myself included, I'll say, um, we wind up in a place where that motivation to train is, is, is being called to something else, or, you know, you're just, you know, if you're, if you're pursuing growth as a human being, eventually getting an extra rotation or getting an extra flip or a bigger pre or at a taller height just Mm. starts to feel like you're not growing as much anymore. And, um, and so you enter this stage and I love the, one of the things I really loved about your book was when you drew in this Greek term katabasis or katabasis, I don't know how it's pronounced. Is, at least that's how I pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about that because, you know, I think there's so many people in, in the, that I know in my community that are entering that state or mm-hmm. emerging from that state and getting sent on kind of a journey of, of kind of entering manhood. And a lot of people, a lot of us, you know, the young men that are training parkour, that's a lot of what I see is our training is about is we're trying to test ourselves. We're trying to put ourselves through these rites of passage that don't exist in modern society. And, you know, we end up, that's why we end up on the tall buildings because we feel like we have to put our life, you know, on the line or, or at least increase the perceived danger to the point where we feel like we're doing something um, real with our lives. For sure, for sure. So catabasis, just to give people some background, uh, is a a Greek term, and it's talking about the fall or the break or the, um, like, the way I describe it is, it's the day that it's the day that you wake up, and everything that you thought to be true the day before is no longer true. Mm. And so that happens on a number of different volume levels. Right. That could just be like, oh, I broke my ankle. Now I can't train. Shit. Everything I was working on is now, okay, there's now this wide open thing ahead of me. And it could be my business just fell apart. I was a computer programmer. I got fired. Now I don't know who I am. And as men get older, a lot of times it hits us with divorce or separation or something where the family unit falls apart. Or, because this is so prevalent in men, a health issue. Mm. Like, oh shit, now I have cancer. Oh shit, now I have heart disease. And so it's that that rock bottom experience. And again, it can be different levels of rock bottom. But I I think why it's important, especially for athletes, right? If you talk to any long-term athlete, and we're talking over the course of 20, 30, 40 years, And even if young people hear this and go, that'll never come. That day will never come. I will do this for the rest of my life. Uh, As someone who works with a number of athletes and was a professional athlete, I will tell you, it often does come. And it's not the, like, it's just a priority shift. It's this, this time when suddenly what was important yesterday is no longer important today. You find this in the different stages of life right? If you get married and have a kid, all of a sudden, a lot of things that were important yesterday weren't that important. You start your own company and now you have 50 employees working for you. A lot of things that were important yesterday are no longer important. So it's this opportunity for people to shift and transition, especially around identity. Mm -hmm. And with guys, when we feel like we've lost our identity, that's when bad shit happens. That's when we find drugs, we find alcohol, we find suicide, we find depression, we find, we find things that we don't really deal well with. And now this, in my opinion, and we can talk about because we're filming this in the virus time, mm. uh, initiation, this to me is an opportunity for initiation. There's this quote by, um, you, you know, Sebastian Younger, 
You ever read the books Tribe or uh, The Perfect Storm? Remember that movie, that Ben Affleck movie where the boat was like this? <laughs> yeah, I remember the yeah. movie. Um, the book's on my list, but I haven't read it. Amazing. So Tribes is an incredible book. And Sebastian Younger was a war correspondent before he wrote it. And he has this quote, you cross the threshold into manhood by facing something that could potentially destroy you. Mm-hmm. We go, oh, cool. That's initiation in a nutshell, right? In other cultures, when we turned 14, someone took us out in the woods and was like, here's a knife and some peyote. If you come back in four days with a deer, like you're a man. If you don't, you're not or some iteration of a initiation. So I view challenge like that, the broken ankle, the cancer diagnosis, the divorce, the just or even the existential moment, Brandon, where people wake up and go, oh, fuck, now what? <laughs> That's kind of like the universe's way of initiating you. It's like, are you going to live through this? Are you going to get through this breakup? Really? You're, gonna, you're just going to drink your way through it, smoke your way through it, fuck strangers your way through it, or are you going to actually dive inward? Are you going to ask yourself, why was I in a relationship where I got treated X, or I allowed Y, or I let my, I, my sense of self get diminished? Why was I in a business where my boss was verbally abusive, where I didn't really believe the mission, where I saw people stealing, but I didn't say anything, or whatever it is in your life? It's your opportunity to go, okay, what wasn't working? How did I contribute to that? Especially as men, how, how am I not taking responsibility for the totality of my life and what can I do about it now? Right? We're doers. This is why I love on some level, love that the whole country is on lockdown because now we're kind of forced to go introspectively. Like, oh, wow, what didn't I like about my life before and what can I do about it? Sure, there's like a four-day Netflix, Instagram, video game, weed period that everyone needs to get through before they're like, oh, shit, this is going to be a couple months. What can I do with this? How is this an initiation for the entire culture? Of Oh, guess what? How you guys were living a month ago, that wasn't really sustainable for the planet. It wasn't sustainable for financial systems, for housing markets, for your health, for all of these areas. So let's just put you in time out and make you sit there and think about it. Right? So again, young men listening to this, you're going to go through a number of iterations of your identity. You know, at six, you might have been super interest, interested in G.I. Joe, and that was your whole life. And then at age eight, you're like, eh, G.I. Joe's kind of lame. I found whatever. And then all of you listening who are parkour enthusiasts, at some point you found parkour. And you might have said, like, this is the thing. This is the thing I'm going to dedicate my life to. This is my religion. This is my identity. This is my friend group. This is my conversation every day. Right? We see this with subsets of any sport. People identify as And now you have the opportunity to ask yourself, what else can I be? What else do I want to be? Right? I love hearing stories of professional. I think Steve Young uh, went and got like a law degree after either while he was playing for the Niners or after. And they're like, why the fuck are you going to do that? He's like, well, I want to be more than just a football player. And I know I'm like one twisted knee away from (laughs) – which you know, like the injury rate, the injury rate for parkour is probably a lot higher. It's like the NFL and parkour are probably on par. Surprise. I know. I mean, I think NFL is probably way worse, honestly, because people are <laughs> trying to tackle you the whole time. But yeah. parkour, if you make a dumb decision, that's one of the reasons it's kind of great is because it is kind of all up to you how stupid you want to be and risky you want to be with it. Yeah. How intelligent and di- disciplined you want to be with it. Um, but No doubt. Yeah. I mean, I've been through several just within inside the parkour era. I've been through some of these, these what the fuck moments. And, and yeah, the biggest one was kind of entering a new era of just being like, Oh man, I don't even, I want to be more than a parkour athlete. I want to be more, you know, I dedicated a lot of time. I adopted it as my religion. I tied my identity completely to this, this parkour athlete person that I was becoming. Yeah. He said every road, um, forks at a certain point or it dead ends or something and you have to do something different with your life. And yeah, I see, I see a lot of, a lot of us, you know, struggling with that. And that's why I want yeah. to up because it is. Yeah. And I, and, you know, and like you said, how do you stay away from the drugs? How do you stay away from fucking your way through it and all these things that we've, 
I, you know, I've tried some of these things for sure. You know, oh, me I, too. As a pro, you know, like, yeah, yeah. that was the go-to. That was the default. And I, you know, I was so unconscious. I didn't even realize that that was the choice I was making. You know, yeah, for sure. I thought that this that yeah. was my solution. That was my best idea, and it worked. Right, for right. Me at the time, but, um, but then it doesn't work. You know, down the road, all of a sudden, you come up against it, and you're like, I don't think another drink or another, you know. No, it's, it's going to set you back to the, to the emotional starting point, mm. right? Like you said, I don't want to, ju- and I'm not saying just as in there's something wrong with being a parkour athlete, yeah. but you're also a podcaster, right? So you're affecting people and you're having conversations that don't have anything to do with, po- with parkour. So you're affecting people on a number of different levels. And I think what's super important for men, especially to ask ourselves is, who do we want to be in totality, Mm. right? Not just what one area do I want to hyper-focus on and make my identity, but how do, and well-rounded person isn't the right way to put it. It's like openly expansive person. How much shit do you want to get good at? Mm. How big do you want to be, right? How expansive do you want to be? How full and rich do you want your life to be? Like if we took the wheel of your life and cut it into the pie pieces, Like, are you eating incredible food that you love? Are your conversations with people deeply intimate? Is your relational life like fantastic and you're, 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 you're getting the juice out of that. What's your financial life like? A lot of times with, let's just call them fringe sports. Like the same thing when I was in jujitsu, it was guys who were like five dudes living in a house all on mattresses and couches, eating peanut butter and tuna fish and having no relationships and being like, we're living the dream, man. Like, well. <laughs> I lived at the gym, taking shots right? behind the gym in a, with a big <laughs> ladder of hot water hanging from the fence, standing <laughs> naked in a field. So I've done that. Yeah. I and you ask people and they're like, we're like, well, it's, it's just a lifestyle, bro. <laughs> right? Like jujitsu is a lifestyle. You're just not dedicated. Like, no, I'm, I really like a couch and um, humans. So I think, Men are really good at specifying. I want to do that. But the challenge is when we make any one thing our identity and that thing disappears, we are lost. Mm -hmm. And being lost is a very dangerous position to be in. So if I can make my identity that of a writer, a speaker, a coach, uh, a content creator, a husband, a father, uh, a businessman, and, and then one of those gets challenged or one of those disappears, my foundation is still pretty solid. And that's a little bit of defense. Like we want to be on defense just for the way the world is. It's like having a um, your, your portfolio as an investor. Like you're not like, oh, all, all my money is in this one thing. Oh, well, what happens if that one thing goes away? Like, I, it won't. Okay, yeah, because in the history of the world, nothing's ever gone away. Oh, which we're seeing now. So I think for men, it's really about, young men especially, and I, I've asked this question in the book, I ask it to everybody, it's something to, if you don't have the answer now, to start thinking about, what are you building? Mm-hmm. Right? First chapter, what are you building? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that you have to be New York Times bestselling on Oprah, writing, speaking, etc., it could be I'm building a life of health and wellness and, and growth. Okay, beautiful. Like that's, you, you know what you're doing. Like I put in the book, I have a guy, a client who's building a, uh, a safe world for his autistic son. Bam. Like, and when you hear that, like, oh, that's a pretty simple thing. No, that's got like 5,000 variables that you and I will never have to deal with. But yet that man knows from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to bed, what he's doing with himself. Now that gives him purpose. That gives him drive. That gives him humans to talk about or talk to. Gives him community. He's involved in the autistic community. He's talking to other parents. He's reading books. He's taking workshops. He's studying. He's talking. Oh my God, that actually sounds like a really rich life, right? So if one part of his life gets diminished, he's still got all these other ones to, to, um, to fall back on. Now, if we go back to catabasis, oftentimes it is that fall, Brandon, that starts the hero's journey. 
Like not a, very few of us wake up one day and go, you know what? I'm really going to change my life in all these ways for the better. It's going to be super hard work, but I know I can do it. I'm going to go into a little bit of debt. I'm going to hire a coach. I'm going to read these books and go to these workshops. It's usually somebody just left me, right? Or I just got injured. For, let's be honest. It's usually like I just broke up. And now I'm fucking heartbroken. And now I'm in so much pain. I'm going to use that pain to do something positive. Or, you know, there's a that doesn't have to death of a loved one. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people who like their father dies, their mother dies. And it's like, oh, shit, life is short. Mm-hmm. Working in a cubicle, like working for someone else, not following up on this one thing I really want to do with my life, even if I get there and I don't like it. Or even if I get there and it's scary, I just, I can't not do it anymore. That's, that's where I love, especially with guys. Cause you see so many guys that are, are running from the fear of that, of like, what if it doesn't work? What if it works? And, I, and then I hate it. What if it works? And then I, if I fail later. So they're, they're stuck in this, this middle, like this purgatory of like, what are you doing with your life? Nothing. Uh, and I'm not picking on video games. Like I'm playing video games, I'm looking at a lot of porn, spend a lot of time on Instagram. Like fuck, bro. Like you, what are you doing with yourself? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, I won't even pretend that like I haven't completely emerged from that those 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 bad habits and those addictions and like. Me too. I'm just I'm right there with you, just to be honest. I can. I'm pl- replacing my bad habits with better habits. That's as best as I can do most of the time. And and I'm thankful that you know you know, like parkour took me out of drinking and gave me a reason to be healthy and gave me a reason to like eat right and learn about my body a little bit better. Cause I was just a gargoyle before yeah. that. And, uh, but yeah, the, I think, you know, defining that vision and defining your purpose, that's really hard. I think it's, or it can be really hard and it can be really scary. Right. Cause what if I pick the wrong thing? What if I don't like it? What if, you know, I, I didn't even think about that until it kind of happened to me where yeah. like, Okay, I achieved everything I wanted. Oh fuck! And it's not now what? now. what? What am I supposed to do now with my life? Right. And um, can you? What What are your um thoughts on just like what are the best things to do to to help you hammer down that vision? Like, sure. is it is it to be? Is it to do it badly and just do it quickly and get it done first? Is it to aim really small? I'm trying to. I'm still working on defining better goals for myself and, and really honing in that big life grand vision because of, mm-hmm. of where I am at just my journey right now. And um, so I'm selfishly asking, you know, sure. <laughs> tips, sure, but sure. also I know a lot of people will help. Yeah, man, it's, there, there's a lot to it. So first let's just frame it that there is no wrong decision. Mm. It's not like, Oh my God, if I hadn't chosen parkour, I would have been like the next rock star, musician, celebrity, billionaire. And now I can do like a twist in the air, but fuck, I should have gone left when I went right. That's not how it works. So you can't make wrong decisions. Uh, I have had probably five complete careers by the age of 44, Mm. like full on. I went to grad school, uh, fought professionally, was a real estate appraiser, owned a chocolate company, owned a gym, and now I'm doing what I'm doing as a writer. And each one of those informed the next. So I write about my bodyguarding career in my 20s. I write about the failure of the chocolate company. I write about the gym. I use what I learned from traditional Chinese medicine in everything that I do, despite not sticking needles in people. But to answer your specific question, let's, let's zoom out a bit. Mm-hmm. When I was, God, I was in my early 20s, I worked for a guy named Gavin DeBecker. He's the author of the book, The Gift of Fear, which is just a fabulous book. Multiple, I think it's been a year on the New York Times bestseller. He owned the bodyguarding company I worked for. And one day I got this email. So I was also doing, we would do residential security when we weren't traveling. So you may be at a celebrity's home sitting in their little guest house. I get an email saying like, hey, Gavin wants you to give him a wake-up call at 6 a.m. And I was like, I I have a fucking degree. Like, I went to a top 25 (laughs) college. Like, does this man not own an alarm? And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. (laughs) And like, I was was on shift at that point. I give him a call. I'm like, good morning, Mr. DeBecker. This is Traver. You have a wake-up call. 
And he just goes, call me back in five minutes and hangs up. And I was like, motherfucker, I am now a snooze bar. Like this is the, like, this is the totality of my skills and talents. Oh man. Call him back uh, a couple of minutes later. And long story short, we end up having a conversation and he asked me like, Oh, where'd you, where'd you go to school? What'd you study? Blah, blah, blah. And he goes, what are you doing working for me? And I was like, ah, oh, you know, I thought it'd be exciting. I don't want to, I don't want to be have an office job, even though I'm like sitting at a guest house watching a security monitor. He goes, do me a favor. I want you to write me an email and say, what would I do if I had unlimited resources? Like, what, what are all the things you do? And then I'll, I'll get back to you on this. So send me that email. I'm like, all right, cool. If one, I have a New York Times bestselling author like helping me. So I sit there. I have like a 12-hour shift and I'm literally like private jet, red, Merce- like red Corvette, Porsche, Islands, you know, Lamborghinis, yeah. Shakira. <laughs> like it was just like a shopping list of shit. Right? <laughs> and and then, here's what I'm thinking. He's going to write me back and be like, here's the magical key to getting all of that. <laughs> like the oh, next mm. days. So I email it to him and it takes him a day and a half or so to get back to me. And he goes, beautiful list. Now, let me ask you again. What would you do if you had unlimited resources, not what would you buy? And I was like, ah, oh, okay. So go back and I like knock off half the cars. I'm like, ah, eh, you know, like one Lamborghini will probably suffice. I can, <laughs> I, I can fly first class. I'm like 24 years old. That'll be amazing. And I essentially send them back the same list, but with like a little bit of like, oh, I may like teach a self-defense class or something like that. Again, day and a half later. Beautiful list, not what I'm asking. What would you do if you had unlimited resources? And so to wrap the story up, it took us maybe three more emails. And all I ended up sending him on the last one was, I would help people. Hmm. And then he wrote back, okay, now you're onto something. How would you help them? And we worked through and eventually it came to like, I wanted to help people health-wise. Like, how could I affect their health? And then it was a decision. Do I go to grad school and become a doctor? Or do I go, I was interested in alternative medicine. And I went Chinese medical route. But if you see, the reason I'm telling you this is because the answer to that question, first, you have to work through your ego, mm-hmm. which is like cars, women, houses, airplanes, et cetera. And it's like, you kind of go from your head. Then it was like, maybe down to your balls, which is like, I would fuck these 27 supermodels. <laughs> Okay, well, don't forget about this area, which is your heart, because your heart is kind of really the truth. When you can answer that question honestly from those three places and then stick with what your heart wants, I think you're on to something. You're not on to the answer, though, Brandon. It's not going to be like, I would work for IBM and their HR department in Milwaukee, and that'll make me happy. But I would help people then became the theme of my life. It required four years of grad school. It required opening a gym. It required starting a blog for that gym. It required that blog getting picked up and getting hired by a magazine, which then required me to be a writer. So at no point in Gavin's exercise did I say I would be a writer. No point. And if you'd asked me back then, I would have been like, that's idiotic. (laughs) That's the most stupidest thing ever. I don't write good. And now here we are after that career, a career as an acupuncturist, a career as a gym owner. Oh, so I tell people, one, when you understand the feeling you want or what's the foundation, I want to help people. I want to be of service. Okay, then the question is, how do you want to be of service? In what capacity do you want to be of service? Right? I remember at one point, Gavin was like, go volunteer. Like one night a week, go work at a a soup kitchen. I was like, no, that's not it, right? Like I want to help people change their entire lives. I can't do that, uh, you know, per se by sliding a tray of soup across them. Yes, it's lovely and it's human, but hmm, okay, now we're onto something even better. You want to help people change their whole lives. Okay, if that's the feeling and the action, what are the mechanisms? Like you're helping people change their whole lives with a podcast, but someone may hate their voice. They may draw really well. 
okay, how do you draw in a way that affects, oh, you draw cartoons, you draw political things, you draw something else. Okay, what's unique to you? If I could, I would be a singer, truthfully, hmm. because you hear, how many times have you heard a song and in like three seconds are crying? <laughs> or still, like, you know songs from 10 years ago that you're still listening to, right? I cannot sing to save my, my life. So it's like I have the little brother talent, though, of writing. I'm like, oh, okay, this is how I can best affect people. So I, I hope that answers. I know it's a long-winded answer. No, 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 no not at all. No, that's yeah, very, very helpful. First, just being curious, right? Mm -hmm. you know, Brandon, people put a lot of pressure on themselves. It's like, you know what? I got Saturday off. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And <laughs> <laughs> that Saturday – Every like, I don't know, every three weeks for a long time in my life. I was like, we're going to do it I <laughs> tomorrow. I would sit myself in a park and I'd be like, I don't even like writing. I don't journal and I'm making myself figure this out right now. It's not happening that way. Right. And then look, here's another sign. Like, look for the clues. Like, look for the little whispers or the taps on the shoulder. When I first opened the gym, in the very first year I opened the gym in 2009, I, took, I joined Toastmasters to be a better public speaker, took a speech about men on their competition circuit, and made it to like the semifinals of the world championships of public speaking with a talk about men. The reason I got kicked out of the competition was the judges said, no one wants to hear about men. I had enough talent to get it that far, but then the, the content wouldn't take it any further. But holy shit, here I am 11 years later with a book about men, a movement about men, talking about men, video, like an online course about men, a membership group about men. Holy fuck. Mm. Now, at the time, again, I was like, I don't know why I want to talk. Like, people, my ex-wife was like, why'd you pick that topic? I'm like, I don't know. And yet it was there. And then a couple years later, I was talking to a teacher who pulled me out of a workshop herself and said, I think you need to work specifically with men. And I was like, that's stupid. Thanks. But no. And I went back in the workshop. Right. And then a couple of three years ago, I, was, I did this crazy outdoor survival school and was meditating in the woods and meditated this whole vision of standing up in front of a group of men and teaching. And I remember getting done with the meditation being like, that was kind of dumb. Right. <laughs> I feel like a total idiot telling you guys this now, but like the clues were there. Mm. So start to look for them, like look for the through lines do you like speaking? When you were little, did everybody say, man, you're really entertaining. You're funny. Oh, you were the kid in the backyard, like taking apart the radio and putting it back together. You were the guy who could always help your friends with workouts, even though you had no workout training. Like look for the through lines and, and be okay with, uh, here's another big piece. I know I feel like I'm rambling, but I think this is no, not at all. I'm, I'm okay. Please go on. I sat on grad school for a year because I didn't think you could make any money as an acupuncturist. Then I went, I just finally surrendered and went through it. And in my first year out of school, because I didn't think you could make money as an acupuncturist, I started a chocolate company that had herb, Chinese herbs infused in it. It did really well until the FDA shut us down because of uh, some other issues, um, the facility we were working in. But think about that. I didn't come up with that idea until the fourth year of school, mm. right? That led me to doing this, which led me to doing that, which led me to what I'm doing now. And now I make a fuckload of money. But I didn't make money doing the thing I specifically set out to do. So if that's your challenge, if you're like, man, I really want to be an X, but there's no money in X, I challenge that belief 100%. Mm. Right. Everyone says, don't write a book. There's no money in it. <laughs> well, there's a lot of money in other things around the book, or you can position the book in a way to make money. So there's, there's that, right? Cause I, I get it. You don't want a whole, you want everyone listening to this, like quitting their jobs and playing a guitar <laughs> in the street and being like that asshole on the podcast <laughs> ruined my life. <laughs> like I get it. Your needs need, still need to be met. Yeah. 
But I think in 2020, if you have a cell phone, a computer, and a drive, and you can tell some stories, and you're open to speaking, you can make money doing anything. Doesn't matter. You don't give a fuck if you're in knitting or, you know, basket weaving or parkour. Like you guys, right? how much money was in parkour? Uh, still zero. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But like, there, there, there's still, you still, no one's making it as an athlete specifically doing that for the most right. part. There's a handful of athletes that have sponsors, but it's always adjacent. It's always like, are you doing stunts? Are you doing performances? Are you doing some kind of gig? Um, yeah. You know, few. It, no one's or do you own a company do you you know i started a company a clothing company in parkour for a while and Amazing. that's where t-shirts behind us right and, um you know it, it's it's a struggle but i learned a lot for sure and uh, it's helped me figure out right. you know, the next stage for sure and uh, you don't know and, and I'm, I'm not saying that you're I don't know. right yeah. you don't know I connected the dots fully yet from where yeah where we, you but know. look at this too it got you to podcast mm-hmm like you don't know if if in five years you're gonna be like I had this one guest on my podcast and then now he and I are business partners and or she and I, I don't care which and now I'm loaded and, <laughs> and thank God I got into the cheapest most unpaying sport in the world because look where I am now yeah right? and again for a lot of people money may, may not be their goal but you need enough to sustain yourself and live and eat and have rent and etc. Yeah, no, well, thank you for, for sharing and, and especially like just seeing the length of the journey, the the phases of it, that can really just in and of itself be inspiring enough to just be like, okay, it's going to be okay. I'm going to keep following my path. I'm not going to, you know, freak out or panic that, 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 that things haven't happened for me yet or that, you know, I don't know exactly where this is going, but I can, you know, I can trust that if I want it, it'll, it'll work out in the right way for me. Yeah. And, and you're doing it. Like you, mm-hmm. it's not that it hasn't happened. It's happening. That's, that's the, beat. you have a podcast. It's <laughs> just that alone is to me is like, Oh, it's happening for this guy. It's fine. It's he's, he's on the track. Yeah. We, we live in this uh, false assumption about overnight success. Mm-hmm. And, and trust me, especially in my twenties, that drove me insane. <laughs> I was going, I was in my twenties for the dot com. Oh first, yeah. But at first it was like, 19 year old kid with one pair of sneakers makes $72 million yesterday. And you're like, how can I not be cashing in on this? Damn it. Yeah. There's all my, I got adjacent, like there's people that just somehow it's millionaires off of Bitcoin or whatever now recently. And I'm just like, I missed the boat. Like, ah. right. But give everything time, Mm -hmm. right? Time is the great equalizer. All those guys lost their fortunes in the dot-com bubble and then had to go, okay, now we need to learn business fundamentals. Mm. And so you talk to just about anybody about their overnight success and it's exactly like yours. Yeah, I had this idea. I didn't know that it would be the fourth step out from the thing that I'm doing now, but it led me to this, which had led me to that. Which And all those times where you questioned, you know, I'll tell you honestly, brother, like, Probably six months before I started writing that, three months before I started writing Man Uncivilized, I called my buddy and was like, fuck this. I'm just going to get a job. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm so sick of trying to make it on the internet and trying like doing a, like online events that no one comes to. Mm-hmm. I had to do a talk in Brooklyn and they told me 250 people would show up and there were eight. And I was oh, like, man, I remember what that. Am I doing? <laughs> right? Like, just. <laughs> start, stop, start, stop, like take one step forward, two steps back. And I learned that this whole game is about resilience. Mm. You know, you're going to hear the story of the guy that like his one Instagram post turned into a viral and now he's a billionaire. (laughs) That's not, that's like 0.001%. Everybody else is slowly, slowly, slowly building their empires or building their visions even better so mm-hmm. empire is a loaded term, mm-hmm. which is building the life they want, right? What if your whole picture is house, fence, training facility, podcast, and maybe a partner? Like that's a lot for a weekend to try to, to mm-hmm. manifest or to build. <laughs> but you can, that's a lot of avenues for you to start exploring right now, isn't it? Yeah. Like, how do I learn about real estate? Hmm. How am I going to make money online? Cool. I should probably do some research into how do I get more people to listen to my podcast? I should probably meet some girls. I should probably look at like training facilities. What is the best? So it, 
it, it gets you engaged, Brandon. Like that's where, that's what I love about talking to groups of men. They look at me and go, I'm so focused. I don't know how to do it, doing it the way I'm doing it. Mm. They go, what if you took your focus and you expanded it out 360 degrees and you watch the light bulb go off over their heads. And then what's even cooler is getting the emails four or five months later where it's, you know, I realized I didn't know how to cook. And so I did these two recipes off YouTube and now I just signed up for culinary school. And you're like, holy shit, that guy's life just got so much more fascinating, mm. right? His journey became so much more interesting. His, his view on the world just went like that. It just got so much wider, right? He's now going to talk about flavors and combinations of like all, he's going to understand nutrition. Like he's going to learn so much. And I'm not pushing anybody into culinary school. <laughs> you but could. just how much have you learned from having this podcast? Oh man, it's unquantifiable. I'm sure. Right? I mean, like I learned how to be a production, like a, an audio producer. I learned a lot about microphones, like things I didn't, was not even interested in for sure. And you know, I've learned how to listen or I'm learning still how to listen because I came up against, you know, that ego thing that you mentioned earlier, just like working through my ego. Ooh, I got a big one apparently because I finally got through some stuff and I realized that, you know, a lot of what I was doing with my podcast initially was a little too focused on me again, a little too narrow. And, and, um, it, and it ran out of steam. It ran out of, of energy because it was not, it wasn't serving enough. It wasn't like, it wasn't, there wasn't value being added, um, in the way that could make me feel like I wanted to get up and do it. Um, because you know, it's just, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that you can really, I'm not the kind of person at least where you can just singularly focus on myself for apparently infinite amounts of time. And I developed a lot of bad habits because, you know, working on becoming a really great parkour athlete actually in some ways fed that beast and fed that, 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 that singular focus. And just, I don't care what everyone else is doing. I'm getting to the, I've got to become this good at this thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that taught me a lot, you know, that taught me a lot about that. And then this podcast has helped me open up my worldview and, and get out of that and, uh, meet interesting people and still continue to scare and push myself, but in ways that, you know, I didn't, you know, think that I would be scared of and a lot about myself, you know, a lot of imposter syndrome stuff comes up a lot about, uh, just insecurities that I have and, 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 um, being vulnerable on the mic and being myself on the mic. That's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, just lots of, lots of stuff. I'm still coming. Yeah. Still Think about it. Like if you had to write a book that was everything that I've learned from zero to where I am today, podcasting, mm. everything from like <laughs> everything that's like, how do you plug a mic in? Yeah. How do, I, Cause people, I'm sure people have asked you, how do you start a podcast? It's like, yeah, well. yeah. And that's, that's been really, that's been awesome when people actually ask me and I have the answer. I'm like, Oh, you do this really. Yeah. It's actually not that hard. You now are an expert in podcasting to, to someone who's never done it. Mm -hmm. So think of how much more, Oh, how much bigger your worldview, bigger, like bigger you as a man are just because you know all that little shit. I think it's, I think it's fascinating and it makes for you to be a more fascinating person. Right. If I sat down with you and, and was like, tell me all about parkour. I was like, okay, cool. We've talked for like four hours. I hope he talks about something else. <laughs> and you're like, you, are you interested in podcasting? I'd be like, holy shit, tell me everything. And you have now have this whole nother chapter book library to open up. Let's talk about mics. What's your favorite mic? Okay. Let's get the mic book out. Yeah. Let's talk about imposter syndrome. Holy shit. Well, there's seven libraries that deal with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, man. Well, and that, that kind of brings me to maybe partially, you know, you've mentioned, obviously you work with men and like your work is surrounding, you know, helping empower men and helping men like figure a lot of the stuff out that we're talking about. And I think, you know, that isolation that you, you discuss and just why, why is it important for men to have other men in their lives? It's a great question. There's something we don't get from women. Mm. There's something we can't get 
from, and I'm not going to exclude gay people here, but I'll just speak heteronormatively. There's something we can't get from someone that on some level we want to (laughs) fuck or on some level we want the validation that they would fuck us. Mm. So when we're in a room full of dudes, that ego drops in, in, a, in a minute. It takes some time, right? Before, if guys are in a competitive mindset, it doesn't. <clears throat> but you throw one woman in a room full of 15 men and the entire dynamic changes. Uh, I've done men's workshops and have an amazing, amazing co-teacher for co-ed workshops who's a woman and she's also a chef. She's like, how come you never let me chef at your men's workshops? I was like, first of all, you're beautiful. Second of all, one woman in that house <clears throat> entirely changes the dynamic. Guys will not drop as deep. Mm-hmm. So we need men because men will also look us in the eye and say, bro, you're fucking blowing it. Mm-hmm. Like you, you told me a month ago that you were going to start this project and you haven't started it yet. What's going on? And we will... There's something, you know, I, I, I know this is a potentially offensive question or a potential, potentially offensive answer, but I've said it publicly a couple times is we have a lot more respect for people who we think can kill us than people who don't. Mm-hmm. And so that like man on man power versus power is like, oh shit, I better listen to this guy. Like the deepest part of my reptilian brain is like, he can kill me. He may have something important to say here. Yeah. Where, unfortunately, we don't listen to women in the same way, and we don't listen to groups of women in the same way. Mm. So from the beginning of time, men have created small groups of men that go out and tackle a problem. Be that, we need food. Let's go hunt. Oh, the neighboring tribe is being a pain in the ass. Let's go to war with them. Mm -hmm. we need to build this building we need to put up this barn let's do that so that's like it's coded in our dna yeah and yet now in 2020 prior to the virus at least we didn't have a lot of things that we needed to do together Mm. so we were naturally just singular and then there's this cultural idea that if we ask for help or if someone if we're we're collaborative or if we don't like if we're not rambo the one guy out there fighting against the army then somehow it's not as valuable or it was weak and just naturally brother men aren't as skilled in reaching out to other men as women are and we have our egos in order for me to reach out to you and say like hey man i'm really struggling one i need to have the skill to reach out and the willingness to admit to you that everything's not amazing mm-hmm. And that's a tough combination. But yet I also find with brothers, with men who are like, I'm not going to judge you. You can tell me, you can literally tell me all, I can go through your internet history for the past 15 years. (laughs) (laughs) Zero judgment. You know why? I'm going to let you go through mine. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to find out from doing this is that you and I most likely have the same pains the same challenges, the same trauma, the same wounds, you know, our same issues with our father or our first girlfriend broke up with us or whatever it is. We have the same root issue, but we're expressing it through a different branch. I'm really into porn. You're really into drinking, right? When we get in the same room and go, oh, his drinking is the same as my porn, then we get to look past this, the, the, the symptom and go, oh, this is just a guy who's hurt. This is a guy who's, man, he's still kind of beat up by his divorce. Or, fuck, he watched his dad beat his mom up. And he couldn't do anything about that because he was a little kid, but he's all banged up about that still. Wow, I really feel for that guy. He's not just a jerk at parties who gets drunk. He's a guy who watched some really hard shit and doesn't know how to deal with it. Okay. So I end up kind of getting off track, but that's the power of a group of men, right? And that, that's the power I, I have found that when men just open up and speak truth, like vulnerability is kind of a loaded word. Mm-hmm. But I've asked guys in men's groups, this is a beautiful question. It's, it takes some time to build and it takes some trust. And I remember when I asked our group here, 
what's the one thing you don't want anybody in this group to know about you? That was an interesting evening, right? I had to answer the question myself, but I'll tell you what, walking out of that meeting, I felt like I would go to war with those guys. I felt like there was nothing between us. There were no secrets, just a clear channel of like brother to brother. And so when that's the case, I feel like I could call those guys and say, I either fucked up so awfully and royally, I did something I never thought I would do, or I just hit a home run. I hit a grand slam and I don't know anybody else to call who's not going to get jealous. Like that, brother, that's the power of men, right? I imagine you guys have, I imagine parkour is a male dominated sport. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Predominantly. Like 80 to 20. That, okay. That so works. predominantly. Yeah. So you guys probably actually have a natural bond that you know with other men. This is common in jujitsu schools, right? It's common in things that are like male, male oriented. The challenge though is, are you taking it down to the emotional level? That is the challenge. <laughs> That's just a challenge. And it takes some willingness for all people involved to say, this is what I want, and this is what I, I'm willing to go there. Mm. And what men haven't been taught up until recently is the quality of that relationship and the quality of that dynamic will give you the thing that you're seeking through so many other means, maybe even through parkour. Oh, 100%. <laughs> that yeah. feeling of, of intimacy, of validation, of I have a place in the world. When you actually commune with people on an intimate level, and I mean intimate, non-physical, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like the feeling you're supposed to get from family that most of us didn't get. That I'm okay in the world, and I'm not alone in the world. Those two are, you take one of those away, I'm okay in the world, or I'm alone in the world, and that's the root of so many of men's specific challenges. Mm. I'm alone. So I'm going to drink, smoke, fuck, play video games, whatever, or I'm not okay. I'm going to drink, smoke, fuck, play video games or whatever until I feel okay. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? It's the drinking, smoking, fucking video gaming, shopping, cocaine, whatever it is, that then becomes the problem. And we think that's the problem. Like, oh, I just need to quit day drinking. It's not the day drinking. It's the reason that you are day drinking. That's the, that needs to get healed. And if it doesn't, you can quit day drinking. And then welcome to cocaine, like six months later, I guarantee you, right? <laughs> yeah. the, the, it will need to jump to a different branch. Definitely. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that because, you know, I, I'm, a, I, I couldn't agree more. And like, I'm definitely guilty of all the, all the above, but also, you know, how do you show up for, for the, for those men? And, and like, where do you find them? Obviously you have the uncivilized nation. And, uh, that's a, good, a great place to start if you're, if, you know, if you're out there looking, but also, you know, if you're looking to be that person, that's going to instigate that group, or if you're looking to just find your brothers, um, great question. Great question. Uh, I don't care if people join my group, mm -hmm. but you're welcome to check out the nation, the uncivilized nation and, or look for any other men's group in your area right? And, or if you don't want this to be a formal thing of every Tuesday night, I go to a meeting, you get to actually just be the one who around your friends can sit can start to ask questions, can start by actually leading with the vulnerability of like, Hey guys, last night I got in a fight with my girlfriend. You know, it just sucks. It hurts my heart. It makes me feel like I'm not enough. And then if someone fires back, teasing you or shaming you, you get, you have the opportunity to say, Hey, you know what? Like, I get it. This is kind of how we banter with each other. But honestly, guys, like I'm hurting here. You know, is there a, is there a different way you can support me than punching me in the arm and telling me like, don't be a pussy. <laughs> like, and that's hard. Right. Yeah. And, and you may, you may get a guy that like, he can't do that. He can't meet you at that level of intimacy because he's too scared to do it himself. But I imagine just from being around so many men for so long that your other friends will be, they've been craving that too. Like we don't want to just talk about football and parkour and chicks and 
stuff on the surface like nobody does. And, yeah. and I'm not saying there's not a time for that. No, no, no. Like for sure. We still bullshit around with that stuff. Um, yeah. So where do you find them? You look for them first. If you don't find them, this is what I tell everybody. If you don't find something, look, and if not, build it. Mm. Right? Like I moved to Denver. I didn't know anybody. And so I started a men's group here. And it was just reaching out to people that I knew or I met or I'd heard like a woman said, Hey, if you ever do something like my, I think my buddy would be a great match. And I'm telling you that was a year ago and our group, it's only six guys, actually now five guys. One guy actually left are so tight. Like we've, we've, we spent weekends in the house together. We've gone to hikes together. We've done adventures together. We've worked through some like a birth of a child, we've worked through death, we've worked through financial problems, we've worked through guys having sexual issues, like we've worked through all of it. And so now, now, when the lockdown happened, I called those, we all got on a group call, like, guess what, we're gonna be fine. If shit goes completely sideways, we have each other. And I'll tell you, man, that answered those two questions for me, the am I safe and am I alone? more than anything else in my life, more than a big a social media following, my friends on the East Coast calling. It was those guys being like, we fucking got you. So look for it. If you don't find it, build it. Awesome. Um, I love it. And uh, I guess, you know, I don't want to take up more of the time than, uh, than you can give right now. I know we're about an hour in, but I do have some more questions I'd like to dive into if you're, if you yeah, have. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, okay. Um, and this is a big one. So, <laughs> but I, I think it's another important thing. So, because obviously we're talking about men and we're talking about how we need each other and that's really great. And also I think something that you're interested in and that I'm also really interested in is like, how does that evolve and how we show up for women as well in the world right now? And how do we enter, um, you know, our partner relationships with, with women in ways that, that are, you know, you have these, these two, um, I, would, I guess they could call them like a personality types that you don't want to be in the, in the beginning of the Man Uncivilized book where you kind of have like this no balls, like all, um, I don't even know, just like a wimpy version of, of yourself that can show up. And there's also like this hyper aggressive, tyrannical person. And these like archetypes are two things that you can't be. They don't allow you to be the, the living being that you are. Um, but also I think it's just, you know, something I, I know that I want to increase in my own life is being able to show up and add value to that relationship and being able to, to be like, really be the man. Like, what does it mean to be that in, in a w relationship with a woman? Beautiful question. Beautiful, beautiful. It starts with you. So first of all, how are you showing up for yourself? Hmm. Right. A relationship is simply a mirror. So if you get mad about X, that's on you. If when you get stressed, you punch a hole in the wall, that's because of your anger issues. If you're having challenges with your partner and you go out and cheat or drink, that's your lack of being able to deal with confrontation. So one, you continually work on yourself. Mm -hmm. right? The three relentlesses are a relentless pursuit of your vision, relentless pursuit of growth, and relentless pursuit of adding value to your relationship. But specifically as a man, I think this is so timely given what we're going through now. The feminine, be that in a woman or in a man, but let's just call it the feminine for, for right now, craves our structure. Mm -hmm. So the feminine is chaotic energy. It is this virus. It is the rapid change. It is everybody thinking and talking and drama and yelling at each other on the internet. And, oh my God, what did that, what did you guys hear? It's this and that. And underneath that, I use the image of the mountain. A mountain still sits there no matter what the storm is above it. It can be snowing, hailing, lightning. It can change every two minutes. The mountain's still the damn mountain. So for men, it's our opportunity to work on ourselves to say, how, how and where am I reactive? Oh, I'm reactive when X happens. Okay, that's some work you have to do. Mm. Our job as men is this, brother. It is to create safety for women. That's our job in relationship. It's not our job walking around the world. It's mm -hmm. our job in relationship. Safety is both groundedness and it's also protective. So 
if I want to, when, I, when most guys hear the word safety, they think of just the tip of an iceberg, meaning like, cool, I got to have biceps and a shotgun. Like, okay, cool. Awesome. You can help. You can protect people. That's good. Now, how do you protect her from you? Oh, shit. That's a big question, right? Most women don't have problems with men on the outside world. They have problems with men on their inside worlds. And most men have problems because we haven't looked on the inside to our inside worlds and go, oh, wow, when I get triggered, I get angry. When I get angry, I yell. When I yell, I get ready to punch. Okay, now we have a problem. So the two character, the two archetypes I I was describing was this stoic 1950s Marlboro man Mm. who has no feelings. He's the guy that constantly says, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You're not fucking fine. Clearly not fine. And anybody who says they're not fine usually says it with like a red face, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, the neck, the vein in your forehead is throbbing. Like you're not fine. But that guy leads. He is a leader in his relationship. He is a leader in his life. I can't tell you how many women have messaged me in the past two weeks saying, holy shit, I wish I had a man in my life. I wish I just knew where this was going to go and I had someone to guide me. And people listen to this be like, oh my God, that's so misogynistic. I don't give a fuck. I get the emails, you don't. How many women are saying, I just want a strong man to lead me right now? Because what do you know? We're in this really unique time of crisis. It's not three weeks ago when everybody was back to their old paradigms. So there's the leadership, like, are you leading? Are you coming home and saying to your partner, hey, everything's going to be fine. We're still on track for what we were going to do a year ago. We're still going to move into that house. We're still going to have get, get married, have the kids, or we're still going to pursue these trips. We're still going to do the things we were going to do. The relationship's good. The other guy was this sensitive new age guy who was all about his emotion and was unwilling. He was codependent. He was unwilling to speak his needs. He was unwilling to to believe he had needs. He was unwilling to be okay without his partner telling him she was okay and therefore he believed he was okay. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So what do women need right now or how do you show up in relationship? I can put it in two sentences. Are you leading or being led? Both are fine. Right. If that's the dynamic you and your partner have consciously agreed on, as in you've used words, you've had a conversation. If that's the case, either way, it's got to be, though. So you sit down with your partner and say, OK, this is what I think. Uh, I'm going to lead in this area. And they go, OK, cool. Do that. Or I'm not going to lead in this area. But most women want men who feel like who men who believe they're leading. There's a certain group of women that doesn't, and that's fine. Please don't email me. But most women, that's what they've told me, right? Uh, And we go to where's the archetypal place of relationship? The bedroom. Most women don't want to be in charge in the bedroom. They don't want to be the one that makes the first kiss. They don't want to be the one that leads. They don't want to be the one that that that's just not who they are. Pull them and ask them. And question number two. What are your wounds, guys? What's your trauma? And what are you doing to actively work on it? That's what women want. That's what we want to be able to give women is that sense of safety. That's all the things on the bottom half of the iceberg. So you have the guns and the biceps. Amazing. What happens when you get triggered? Oh, shit. Okay. You didn't even know what triggered was. Now you do. Now you know what your trigger is. What are you doing? Are you going to therapy? Are you in a men's circle? Are you working on it somatically? Are you, are you, are you doing something beyond thinking about it? Are you healing it? When guys are doing that, when guys, I'm telling you guys, this is the, like the magic fucking secret. When you are actually leading and you're actually working on your shit, you will be irresistible to women because they know you're safe. Like, oh, wow, this guy knows where he's going, and he wants to take me with him. People are going to get upset by that sentence, man. Yeah. It's true. It's, it's true in my experience. Well, and I think it's worth diving into it just a little bit is just why, you know, I mean, I think 
we are in, in time, and it's an interesting time, right? Where we are, I think I, I listened to a, a podcast with you and uh, Jamie Thompson or Jamie, mm -hmm. um, a, a sex coach. And like, you know, you talked about how it's a time of merging the masculine and feminine. They're, they're communicating again or communicating in a way that they haven't in millennia or maybe ever. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> do you have any thoughts on just, obviously this is a true experience. You're understanding that women want to be led. That's your experience. That's what you are seeing. And also you understand that we live in a climate where that can come off as misogynistic or um, disrespectful in some way. Mm -hmm. What is the difference, I guess, if, if you can define, or could, could you define a difference of just being like, what is, how is that a leading masculine presence mm -hmm. not something that is um, trying to dominate, uh, dominate or, it, yeah. yeah it, it's a great question. I get what you're asking. Yeah, it's, it's tough yeah. to put into a question for me. No, but I get what you're asking. And, how and, is the masculine and feminine changing so that we are still men, masculine and feminine? Mm -hmm. without um you know you know what i'm asking there's a key word here's what you're asking what's the difference between misogyny and leadership mm -hmm. right for the most part and if we take out some of the cultural extremes of like both sides of the coin having some fruitcakes on them and we go to the middle it says heart-led leadership is what we all want right now mm -hmm. Right? No one wants totalitarianism. No one wants dictatorship. A leader who doesn't have his heart involved is a dictator. That's the guy who says, do what I tell you because I told you. Mm. A leader with his heart involved says, come with me. This place we're going to go is amazing. Trust me. I've earned your trust. I've earned your trust through consistent action over time. Here's the vision for I want to take us. I'm including you in that vision. I've included your opinion and your, your, your color and your thoughts and your ideas in that vision. So it's inclusive. Mm. Like that's so different than do what I do what I tell you because I told you. Yeah. Right. And if we go back to so many parental relationships, why are they challenged? Because as kids, we just got told like, do what I tell you or I'll hit you. Do what I told you or I'll punish you. Like no one sold us the vision or at least in, you know, I grew up a little bit in, in the, I grew up in the eighties. So it's a little bit different. Maybe it's different now, but there wasn't like, Hey, this is a much better way to live. Trust me. It was just do it. So when you talk to anybody, even if you talk to men and say, how do you want to lead? And they make, Oh, I just, I just want to tell people what to do. Like that's, that's dominance. Mm -hmm. And sure. There's a place for that. We can, that's a whole nother conversation, but mm -hmm. Everything has to be consensual, right? Even leadership. Like, and, and if you, you'll run into relationships where you have two leaders, a man and a woman who are both leaders, those relationships don't work. Jamie, who I, who I interviewed, a great, great friend of mine, she was one of the first people ever to say to me, I don't want a 50-50 relationship because I think that's even muddy. Like I'm willing for there to be a 51-49% energy in the relationship where my partner's leading. And I've talked to people that go all the way down to 10 and 90, like women and men, both on both sides of the coin saying like, I just want to be told what to do. I want like a 1950s situation and the man could be the stay at home. The woman, it doesn't matter. Yeah. People have their comfort levels, but I'd say primarily the energy of the masculine is leading the energy of the feminine is collaborative. And so what Jamie and I were talking about is the integration of the masculine and feminine within you, the man, and within you, the woman, but within you, the man, that actually is an, a, a leadership that has invitation in it because the heart's involved, right? Again, if my heart's involved, I have to tell you what to do. If my heart's involved, you're going to come with me because I'm going to invite you. Sure, there may be times when, when I have to, you know, a leader has to lead. But again, if the, if the frame is what I'm doing is, is actually in the best interest of everybody involved, then both people relax knowing that and they can trust each other. Like if you've ever worked, I've worked for guys, so like I get it. You care about everybody 
more than you care about your own opinion or yourself or your need to be right or whatever it is, I'll follow you to the end of the earth because that's a hell of a leader. And I've worked for guys who are like, do it because I fucking told you to. I'm like, oh God, you're just a jackass. You're like a high school bully. <laughs> so I think that's the difference. And women aren't looking to be let dominated. Most women. No. Like nobody is. Nobody's looking to be subjugated. Yeah. Nobody's looking to be put down or made to be feel less than. Right? And everybody's looking for a place in the world that actually feels good to them. So when we talk about relationship, if you're a man who likes to lead and needs to lead and feels that energy, and it's not just ego, but it's coming through your heart, then find a woman who wants to be led. And that feeds her. She feels enlivened by that. She feels good and healthy and, and has high self. She has high, high enough self-esteem to allow herself to be led. She's not being led from a place of woundedness. Then you got a great relationship or swap them. Right? If you're a guy that loves to be led, find a woman who wants to lead. But don't pretend that you don't. I think that's where we were a month ago. We were still, and, and I'm on the back end of this cultural idea. So I get the emails day by day by day by day by day by, from women who say, God, I just want a strong, traditional, but yet open hearted man. And I'm not allowed to say that or else I'll get crushed publicly. Like I got those, I still get them. Mm. But now that we're dealing with a crisis, holy shit. I actually saw a Facebook post the other day by a, a very well-known female writer that said, men, now we actually need you. And I was like, oh shit, the tides have turned. Oh, why? Because it's scary now. We don't know if we're three weeks away from anarchy. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the next couple months in the world. And, and our fantasies and fears have run amok, right? Like I lie in bed at night. Like, I hope the zombies aren't coming, but like it was a lot more possible than it was three weeks ago. Yeah. Three weeks ago, it was like, I can't wait to have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this has been a little bit of a shift. Oh man. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I love it. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. I. Uh, I have one last question, I guess, if you, if you have the time. It's just, sure, sure, sure. what idea do you think is the most healing in society right now? What, what is like the idea that you, that you are most interested in? Mm, that's a and great question. I'm interested in people respecting each other. I'm interested in our differences being celebrated. I'm interested in... in you know what it is? I'm interested in radical honesty, mm. right? How much shit were we willing to overlook a month ago? What I'm after now, what I think is the most healing is going to be people going, actually, you know what? I don't believe that. Mm. I know it's a really popular social opinion right now, but I actually don't believe that. And then taking that to the step of, I'm not willing anymore to put up with lies and falsehoods and um, I'm looking for a word, but I can't think of it. Uh, things that are fake Bullshit. just because <laughs> yeah, illusions. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the way it's always been. Right. Like I just read that a bunch of senators cashed out a bunch of stock oh, yeah. a couple weeks before the virus came out, like pretty clear stuff that they were, they, they knew and they, and you know what? I wasn't shocked. Yeah, I wasn't like, oh my god, but they're <laughs> politicians and public servants. How could they what? do that? Right? It's like at this point where you're like, oh, a little kid got molested by a priest. You're not like, that's impossible. Yeah. Like, oh, really? Another one? Great. Yeah. I want. I think what's healing going to be healing for us. Actually, let me answer this two ways. Is one that of like the collective decision to call out illusion, mm. and then two for community to come back together. For people to realize that, oh my God, this is the beauty, the most incredible thing that's happened to relationships, the coronavirus, and to relationships and internet memes. Like both are making, it's like their heyday right now. <laughs> oh, people realize that, you know, it's a lot more important than my 80 hour a week job. My buddies from high school. Yeah. Holy shit. Oh, wow. I, I should probably go introduce myself to my neighbor. 
this human who's lived 10 feet from me for 15 years. So I'm just like, good morning, mm. maybe twice a week, but holy shit. Now they're, Oh, now they're important to me. So I think that's really what's going to heal us. We got so far away from the basics, mm. which were truth, intimacy, community, camaraderie, right? The, the truth of, I want to feel good in my life. And I want to feel healthy. I want to feel like I'm on purpose. I want to feel like I matter. I want to feel like I have other people around me who care. Like these, these aren't revolutionary ideas that I'm putting out. And on some level, when we hear them, we go, oh, yeah. <laughs> we forgot about that. Yeah. Right? We, we traded a, a house that's five bedrooms too big and Netflix for that or social media for that, right? For or being busy for that. Mm. So I think those are the two ideas. I love it. Yeah, man. That's really great. I think it's, it's right on the money too. And just, it's cool to see that. I think it's going to happen. And yeah, we have so many voices now out in the world, including this one. Right. And uh, part of, part of the next process is whittling it down to the real truth and, and everyone being honest, like you're saying. So For sure. uh, my goal is to be as honest as possible. <laughs> as right. radical as honest, radically honest as I can be in this podcast from here on out. There you go. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I'll be sure, you know, everyone's going to know where to find you in the links and the in the and everything. And, and, uh, I can't recommend the book enough if you guys haven't read it. So please check it yeah. out. And, uh, hopefully, you know, when this is all over, we can connect in, in person and hey, man, have a cup of coffee with you, brother. Awesome. Enjoy your day. Cheers, brother. Take care. See ya. Oh, yeah. All righty. That was 81. 81 episodes in. And damn, we've had a bit of a hiatus, but we are going to come back strong, baby. The virus has brought the beast out in me. And I hope it's brought the beast out in you, too. Beasts out? Whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. And... I just want to be on the back end of this episode just to remind you one more time to look at Traver's links that are in the description to his book, to his website, to his TED Talk, to whatever you're interested in and if you if you enjoyed that episode. And of course, if you have anything you want to do to support this podcast and this platform and myself, that's all in the description as well. And you know you can do it if you want to because it's free to help. Uh, you know, I guess if I'm going to make a direct request, the five star reviews are the biggest things, you know, that's the algorithms and all that bullshit. Um, but we need them. So pump us up. If you got anything less than a five star review, the fuck out of here with that shit. All right. And, uh, much love to everyone and appreciate you guys listening. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.